This is the Shepherd from WeLoveMetal.com, and I'm here tonight speaking to Alex Landenberg from 21 Octane. First of all, thank you, Alex, for taking the time to speak to us and our fans. Hey, you're welcome, man. No problem. Thank you for having us. But well, absolutely, um, I, I want to make it known to everyone out there that our goal at We Love Metal, as far as 21 Octane is concerned, is we want to be the leader on the forefront. When you come to the States, when people want information about 21 Octane, you know, we, we want it to be this place. Um, this is hopefully, uh, you're welcome. This, hopefully this is uh, the first of many uh, interviews that we'll have. And uh, I want to start by saying, it, it seems to me, and you obviously know much better than I do, that Into the Open, your debut album, it, it's had great success right from the get-go. Uh, what's the experience been like so far for you guys? Oh man, I mean, uh, that's off the charts. I mean, of course, you hope for for that kind for that kind of success, but, but um, you know, especially in today's times with the, so many records that are being released almost every day, you know, you you cannot really expect it. So um, we're overwhelmed with the whole reaction. We um, the thing, especially the the fact that people love the diversity of the music. This is something I'm extremely happy about because we were a little bit afraid that people might think it's a bit too much, you know? But uh, on the contrary, people love it. So it's been fantastic. So far it's been great. Lots of great reviews and um, the sales have been pretty strong the whole time. And yeah, we had a blast so far. It's, it's absolutely wonderful. I love the artwork and the message. Of into the open, they seem to go, you know, together so well. They're so thematic. There, uh, how quickly did you realize that this band was special and this album was going to be special? Well, I think uh, we all realized that probably even at the first jam, the first time we all jammed together as a four piece, uh, we we wrote a song on that day. Um, Leave my hat was the first song we wrote on the very first day, and. Um, you know, it was um, immediately we had a great connection musically and personally, and we, we knew we had something. And um, so, yeah, that, that was that was pretty clear from from the, from the get go, pretty much. Um, and regarding the, the the theme of the record and everything, actually, the the whole thing came together real quickly. I remember we were writing uh, into the open the song. And I can't remember, was it, uh, or is it Mark? I mean, somebody said, hey, this, this should be the title of the record. It would be a great title for the record. Because that's, that's what we feel like. We, you know, we want to take our music and our band out into the open, you know? And uh, that, that's what you do when, when you when you start something new. You, you put your, you know, your heart, your, yourself on the line. You go out there into the open. So the message was um, it just fit really well to, to how we felt. And you were in a different band when this all came together. I mean, there was many, you know, d different bands. But um, did you meet uh, who? Did you meet Andrew first, and that's how it happened for you? Um, in a way, I met Andrew first. Uh, Andrew and I, uh, I, we've been playing together off and on for maybe ten years or something. Basically, when he started playing bass, we we were always playing together here and there, but. Um, the idea for 21 Octane started with Marco and I. When Marco and I met for the first time, um, when I was actually auditioning for, for a band called Axis from Germany, we, we started talking about um, putting it, our own band together. And um, so it was at that moment already, I think, um, yeah, I said, hey, I got this great bass player, this fantastic bass cat. Let's bring him in. So um, the three of us, that was it, it happened pretty quickly, you know. The thing was to find a singer. That was actually tougher, you know. Well, you certainly so found one, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> you certainly found a great one to fit with what you guys are doing. It just, it just sounds. <laughs> oh, it does. It sounds so good. You know, one of the things that I know a lot of fans. I know I enjoy. My wife enjoys. Other people that are starting to get to know you are, are telling me about the album is. It, there's a, like a natural way for you guys as individual mus musicians to have time to kind of have the spotlight, but it's never at the cost or the expense of the total song. 
Sometimes it's yeah, of course the song is always a priority. That's that, that's clear, you know. And um, I think that's just natural to us. We that was one of the things about the band from you know from the beginning. We we said we just play the way we play. There's no rules or anything to it. And there's no frame or style that we want to limit ourselves to. It's just the four of us and the way that each of us plays or, or sings. So it happens very naturally. And um, I mean, you just have that feeling to always leave, you know, one guy maybe a little more space to play a little more. But um, we just don't want to lose the song in, in, in the whole, you know, in the whole process. I think that's the, the most important thing. That's something I, I've always liked about many other bands too, that that you, you can, I mean, that it's not, how can I say, many people think it's, a, it's um, you either have a great song or you have great playing, and I don't believe that, you, you can't have both, you know? One thing doesn't exclude the other, so um, I'm happy, happy to hear that you feel about it that way, it's fantastic. Yeah, and there's a couple of songs to me that stand out as far as the drumming, you know, and also the bass playing. I think uh, me, myself, and I, and dear friend, seem to have uh, lend them themselves to you guys kind of having the spotlight a little bit more and just just kind of jamming a little bit. It kind of reminds me a a little bit of the Winery Dogs, if you're familiar with them. Sure, sure, of course, yeah. Yeah, what what songs on the album? Do you enjoy more than the others? Does it work that way? Or are there so much like, I really like to play this one live? Uh, oh, that's a good question. Um, well, it's certainly about what you said. Um, for example, a dear friend is a fantastic one to play live. And it, and it has a lot of really interesting patterns in there and a lot of changes. And to, to bring that alive and to, to play that well, that, that, that's always interesting and challenging. And, um, same with me, myself, and I. The, the interesting thing with me, myself, and I is the tempo because it's it's kind of slow. And life with your channel, you always want to play it a little bit too fast. And it's very mm. it's, it's very tempting to go a little too fast for that one. And but you have to take it slow, you know, that, so so that it has that kind of heaviness to it. And um, so that's always interesting. And we we that that jam part in the middle, we leave that a little bit open live, we, we sometimes play a little bit short, a little bit longer, and that, that's another fun thing about the event for me, because um, with many bands these days, you know, everything is very strict regarding um, that, that you have the MacBook next to you, and you have the click track, and, a lot, and maybe you have some, some tracks coming off the MacBook, and you, you know, everything's synchronized, and there's not much... Um, you can't really be spontaneous with it in, in, in a setting like that. And that's also interesting in a way because you have to be really perfect in these kinds of settings. Because for example, what I have to do with Rhapsody, where everything is um, synced, not only the audio scene, but also to the video, also to the video and stuff. So um, there's not, not much space there. Everything has to be really, really perfect. And so on the other hand, with 21 Octane, I enjoy that freedom, that musical freedom that we have. You know? And uh, that's just so much fun. So yeah, definitely those two. Uh, my teddy bear. That's the one I probably enjoy most playing live. What a great song to play live. What determines or who determines what songs uh, make it to the radio? I and mean, obviously, besides the stations and the fans who mm -hmm. you know want certain songs. I guess the question I'm asking is, um, when you think about, do we release "Turn the World" or do we go with? Um, I don't know in, into the open or for what or or the heart. What what was your determination of we're going to release this one first, this one next, or, and and just go from there? Yeah, quick question again. Um, this, regarding that, we've been really lucky so far that that we always had the last word, even though with, with AFM Records after we signed, the the choice of, of singles has always been ours so far. And, um, for example, with the first two songs that we released, I remember we had this discussion within the band, and I, I was, I felt pretty strong about that, that I, I wanted to make sure that the first two songs are showcasing two different sides of the band. So we picked the, the more sort of classic rock thing with the heart save me as the first one. 
And then it was very important for me to pick something more, a little, a little darker, a little more metal. As a second song, with, which then was Dear Friend, so that people already know that this is not just a classic rock thing, you know? And I think, for example, in this regard, we are also different um, compared to What Are We Talks, something there. I think they're more in that bluesy, you know, pentatonic thing, and they're, they're doing more of that only. So um, that's the kind of stuff that we think about. And of course, uh, Turn the World has singer written all over it. Oh. But um, we didn't really release it yet as a singer, but the radio stations have picked it up. Even, and that was fantastic for us, even the mainstream radio stations. That was something that came completely unexpected to me with the first record, you know? It was more like a long-term goal or rather a hope than a goal, you know? And they picked it up. That was uh, amazing. Even well, one time I remember Mark and I were sitting in the car trying turn on the radio and they were playing that song. Oh. Really, 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 I know the song that was into the open that they played, but anyways, they, they played the song, so they, that was a crazy thing. Yeah. So, again, so far, the scenes have been picked regarding this thing that we want to showcase all possible sides of our music. Well, I'm not surprised that Turn the World has been picked up. Um, I, when I wrote you know, the review, that song jumped out to me and I don't know if the radio station airplay is different in the States than it is in Europe, but turn the world to me is bring you to tears. Good. And it has mega, mega hit in the States written all over. I, I I'm just waiting for the day that people around here get it. And then I, I don't know the sky's the limit. That song is so powerfully good. But what I like about the song is to me, it has a sadness to it, but it's kind of a beautiful sadness. And maybe it's not, Maybe that's just my own interpretation of it, but that's also uh, part of music. That's that's a great thing. I, I know, I know what you mean. Yes, it, it's it's a little. It has a little bit of melancholy to it too. You know, it's yeah. not just you know all major chords and all all happy. No, no, no. I, I know what you mean. It's um, it it's a little. I guess it's a little deeper. At least I hope. And um, yeah. I'm, I'm, I love it. I mean, I remember when, when uh, Marco came up with that one um, early on, and it's the, the kind of thing that you where you know how oh, that's a, you just know that's a great song. You, you have to do it. And then when when Hagen started singing it, that's really fantastic. But yeah, I wish I wish more even more radio stations would pick it up, especially in this case. I know it kind of it has a very very American thing to it. And let's just hope for it. It would be fantastic if more people could hear it, for sure. Well, I think I think they will. In time, I really do believe that. When you, as a drummer, when you think about, do you believe that it's the job of a drummer to drive the band or just be a piece of the puzzle and fit in at certain times, you know, kind of flex a little more? What What's your approach or philosophy? I know totally. You, you have to... You have to be driving the band, and you have to be, um, you have to support the music totally as a drummer. It's, um, that's, that's really the job. I started, um, playing, when I, when I was a kid, I was playing in the, in the big band, like, big band swing, jazz. And from, I remember uh, that our music teacher, he told me, he said, you have to be leading the band, you know, you're, you're keeping the time for them. And they're all looking up to you for that. And it's true. That's the job of the drummer. You're, you're, you know, holding it together. And, um, I think it's it's tremendously important, not just because I'm a drummer. Of course, (laughs) everybody likes to think that the job is important, but I think, really think, um, it's, it's really critical of what we do. It's really interesting. And actually, especially with the songs that are apparently easier, you know, something like, for example, Turn the World, where there might not be so much going on drumming-wise, but especially in those songs, you really have to support the other musician and support the song, and then leave space for them, and at the same time, be sort of a guidance. So yeah, I think that that's the role of drummer, totally. Thank you. I know in, in our email interview, I believe you mentioned that Toto was a big influence on you. Is that true? Uh-huh. Why so? Uh, totally. I, I 
I mean, um, I got something from early on. I, I had my, I have an older brother. My brother is uh, eight years older than I am. And so when I was a little kid, um, let's say I was whatever, six, seven years old. For example, he and, and his friends, they were listening to a lot of Toto. And um, even with, before I started playing music myself, I I just loved the groove they had. And, and I think this, this is a perfect example of musicianship, but uh, without showing off. You know, putting the song first. And as, as a drummer, you know, starting with Jeff Foncaro and then, of course, Sam Phillips. It's anyway, it's just wonderful. And also, actually, the new guy, Keith Carlock, um, Sam Phillips just left him, I think, earlier this year. And also, you got Keith Carlock, again, fantastic drummer. So from, from this point of view, anyways, it's fantastic. Fantastic music, fantastic band. And of course, I just like these, these uh, typical uh, AR bands, these 80s bands. I'm a huge journey to that, too. You know? So you know, when I say a song like Make Believe by Toto, you you totally understand that with the saxophone and the... Mm-hmm. Oh, sure, wow. Sure, from, from four, yeah. Oh, wow. That, one, yeah. that is That's beautiful. That's a, You know, as, a, as someone that loves metal, it's Toto's not a band, I think, that I've ever heard <laughs> discussed on... Uh, <laughs> On a, in a interview, so this is really uh, yeah. You talk about diversity, that's for sure. But that's that's neat to hear. Let me ask you about another band that uh, is kind of interesting when it comes to metal. You know, are, are they metal or not? What, what's your feelings about Queen? Queen, yeah. So I mean, you gotta love them. I mean, it's uh, it's again something I grew up with. Um, but then again, I'm not even the biggest Queen fan in the band is Marco. He's crazy about Queen, but. Like crazy in a way that he also knows all the obscure songs and you know all the B sides and everything from all the records. Um, but I'm also definitely more than just a greatest kids guy concerning Queen. I love it. I, I love it. Always loved it. And um, what they of course had. I mean, they had Freddie Mercury. You know, that's that's just you know not even one in a million. It's probably one in a billion. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And um, so you have an incredibly good band, but then you have that guy also on top of it. And it's, I wish I could have seen them live. That's I'm too young for that, I guess. <laughs> sure, sure, yeah. As, as most of us are, you know. Right. Uh, so, but even the things, the videos you see, the stuff you can see now on YouTube, it's just incredible, you know. Yeah, he could command a stage like maybe no other performer yeah. I've ever seen. So so dynamic, so in tune, but also a little bit, I don't want to say arrogant, but in a way that just draws you to him. He he had people mesmerized. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And it wouldn't have been, would have been so interesting to see what they would have come up with, you know, if he had, you know, if he could have lived on, you know. Right. Because if you look at Indiana, of course, the thing about Indiana is, I guess, him knowing that, um, you know, he would, he, you know, he was actually about to die. I mean, when, even when they were recording it, he was, he was basically deadly ill, you know that. So I think that, that dark vibe and this melancholy the record has in many places, because of course was influenced by, by that. So without his illness, I think it would have been a different record, you know. Right. But still, it would have been so interesting to see, for example, how they would have dealt with the 90s. Yes, yes. Absolutely. Well, I read it, and this is kind of from a different place, but I read an article this morning, uh, and in the article, Gene Simmons actually wrote the article or was quoted heavily in the article, and he made the claim today that rock music is finally dead. And he's... (laughs) <laughs> and he said, he, yeah, he, he I said, read uh, I read it, I read the article. Oh, did you? Okay, so you know what I'm referring to. It It really bothered me, so I want to know, I wanted to get your reaction to it. Yeah, I think, well, you know, the headline, that, that's like, it's a catchy headline. It's typical Gene Simmons, I guess, to, you know, to give that sort of statement. But, to, of course, the, the statement is bullshit, you know. Uh, but the stuff he says within the interview, unfortunately, in many ways, is true, you know. See, we just discussed this the other day, and I think if you really, in 
newcomer with no connections whatsoever and to the music industry and you know no formal record that you that if you are known in any way i think it's really really hard to say but it's not impossible i think at some point um it has to change i mean of course now you still sort of have what i like to call the dinosaurs you know the iron maiden and black sabbath and whatever and they're still headlining the big festival if you look at you look at posters from big festivals and if you look at posters from 15 or 20 years ago it's always the same headliners still and that's just that's stupid in many ways but at some point i think they will just naturally die off i mean dying off in a way that they just stop making music so um there has to be some change and some sort of new generation also of bigger bands again but um the point i think the shows are trying to make is actually unfortunately not that raw but um still i think there's hope you know and i would, I would actually like to believe that a band like ours you know is, is a little bit of that hope or symbolizes a little bit of that hope that that there is for rock music you know yeah and, and, and like you said with gene simmons when he's in front of a microphone and cameras he he does what he does. And for him to make a claim that the last creative thing that was ever done in rock music was Nirvana is just, is a ridiculous statement. And I think that we all know that. Yeah. Um, some, hopefully some better news. I'm just dying for you guys to get over here to, to the States. Is that in the works? Is it already in the works? Is it, where, where are you guys on that? Uh, of course we want to do that. It, it is sort of in the works now. We're, we're trying to figure out if we can um, do a couple of dates around the NAMM show. But that, that's just because uh, anyways, two or three of us will, will be there. So then it's just a matter of flying one or two more over to the States, you know? When that was that? Make it easier. What, uh, what was the date? Or the... Uh, uh, that, that should be the end of January or yeah, the end of January next year, the, the, the winter now. But um, it's like, you know, we're just thinking loud, you know, here. It's um, nothing set yet or anything. Definitely we'll try to come over as soon as we can. But um, so far, the, the plan, it's just, it's more ideas than a real plan, you know. Okay. It's what you call a plan. Sure. How, what, how did the name come about for the band? The name, um, well, the thing is, trying to find a name after four years of rock music, you know, for a band, you know, it's, it, it turned out to be extremely hard. We, you know, every time we thought, oh, this is a cool name, you, you, do, you do a quick Google search and you, you realize, damn it, there's like 20 bands <laughs> on that name already, right? <laughs> uh, so, um, it's, it's impossible. So, um, I really like that uh, Spock Spear record, Octane. So um, I suggest Octane as a bad name. Of course, there were like, whatever, 30 Octane huh. or 40 or whatever. And um, then, then it was just a natural process to think, okay, we might write it a little bit differently. And um, that, that worked already, Octane. I think we could have left it like this. And then Marcus suggested the number. And it just sounded good. And um, we like to, you know, to see the way that the 21 also symbolizes the 21st century, meaning that this is a band for, for the, the 21st century. Oh. Like this. And Octane is sort of a power thing, you know, even though 21 Octane is probably, if you, if you try to run a car with 21 Octane, that might not work so well. <laughs> but, you know, but still, and that actually, a, that would be a good, you know, sticker for a car like this car runs on 21 octane there you see you're coming up with marketing ideas by the second huh yes <laughs> <laughs> that's good yeah i had a yeah, so that, that, that's how the name came about and um, yeah i think it's, it's, it's cool it's just it's always important to to spell it to people like this because otherwise yeah. they might have a hard time finding it yeah i had a friend uh when i i sent him a link to a song i said you gotta check this band out and he said I know how heavy a music you like. Twenty one octane, that's gotta be the wrong name. It's gotta be like hundred and eighty octane. That's crazy. <laughs> that's fantastic. 
But it did start a nice conversation about the band, so I was happy about that. That's cool. Yeah. So where are you, where are you guys out at right now? I know that you toured. Uh, I know you were in Amsterdam or Holland, at least, the Netherlands for a while, and, and in Germany and in Europe in general. Where, where are you at right now? Yeah. Um, right now, right at the moment, we're actually we're, we're doing songwriting already for the second record. And we're pretty far into the second record already. Oh, wow. Um, because we want to make sure that, that we can that we can have a um, you know, 2015 release. We will really release next year. And um, to, to, you know, sort of not lose the momentum. Right. But of course, the, the quality comes first. So we said to ourselves, okay, we start songwriting now. If it works, it works. If we can put out the record early next year already or sometime next year, we do it. But of course, only with the materials. But I can tell you, so far, we're, we're pretty happy about it. And um, I have a good feeling that the record will be will be done whatever sometimes people next year or so on and put up you know, hope for a for a, a two fifteen release. So that's that's where we are right now. And other than that we're just um, playing shows here and there we're, we're preparing our first bigger tour in um, Europe because we'll be um supporting you right in ah. uh, November. Which is great because it's, it's gonna give us the opportunity to play bigger audiences. Like, you know, basically for the first time, apart from a couple of festivals, this is going to be the first time where we can play whatever, almost 20 shows to, you know, bigger audiences. This is going to be a really great thing for that. Excellent. And that, this is going to be, I think, November. So that's, yeah, that's where we're at right now. So okay. riding and getting ready for that tour. All right. Well, I know that you're a busy man. I, I won't take up too much from your time, but what uh, what would be what's a perfect day for you? What what does a perfect day consist of? That's a great question. Nobody asked me that. A uh, perfect day for me consists of um, first of all, waking up not tired, meaning I I slept enough. Coffee, lots of coffee, and uh, then on to the drums because that's actually what I love doing most of. Um, and then just playing and practicing for a couple of hours and feeling like I've, you know, I'm, I'm a better musician than I was a couple of hours before, at least a little bit. I made some progress and then anything, you know, then hanging with friends and family at night. There's also a, a life beside music, you know, besides music. So that's but a perfect day. That's, there, there, there's so many ways of spending a perfect day. That's, um, to be honest, when I'm touring, actually, that, that's what I feel best about of myself, to be honest, because that's when I know I'm, I'm doing what I, what I think I do best, you know. Sometimes when you're at home, you're off a tour, I, I sometimes feel a little bit useless, you know. I'm like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm practicing, doing this and that, but you start to feel, yeah, like, what am I actually doing here for real? And then when you're touring, you know it. You know, you play every night to people, and that's fantastic. So um, that's that. Of course, perfect. I could also be hanging at the beach, you know, but I'm not the, the vacation type. I, I can enjoy it for a day or two, but then I'm getting itchy. I need to, to jump, you know, need sure. to work on something. Well, one last question because you brought up vacation. My wife and I have been to Germany just once, and we right. we spent a day in Frankfurt and then a day in Rothenburg. Where where should we go next? Okay, wait a second. So we were Frankfurt, and what, what was the second one? I think it was Rothenburg. Okay, yeah, uh, could have been somewhere in the south. Yeah, it was uh, closer yeah. to the south. Well, okay, Frankfurt and then that. Uh, well, definitely, I suggest you should. Um, it's a very basic one. Now, now, many of my German friends might, you know, roll their eyes. But I think there's this town called Heidelberg, you know, it's very, very beautiful. I know a lot of my American friends uh, love it because it's typically European in many ways. And there's this old castle, this big old castle and stuff that, um, that I guess you don't really see, you know, in North America. Um, so Heidelberg, I could suggest totally, but also Hamburg is 
wonderful. Munich is great. You know, Berlin is a fantastic city itself. The whole Cologne area is great. Cologne, the, the, this classic huge cathedral that you just have to see, for, you know, at least once in your lifetime. And then the Cologne area, you can also go out at night. And, but Germany is full of nice places to visit. I can only suggest you come back more often. Thank you. like it when you went there. Yeah, I, I I hope we get back. It was two days in Germany was just not not really a, enough to. It's just a taste. I, I want more of yeah, that. Of course, it's just a taste. Yeah. Don't you like it? Oh yeah, absolutely. I we we drove south, um, but, you know, down to to Austria, Austria. Uh, so we got to see a little bit of the countryside. But I wanted to go to I I don't know if I'm saying this right, New Schwanstein Castle. Yeah, New Schwanstein. Yeah, that was part. Of, of course, Oktoberfest is on the uh, the uh, list. You have to do that at least once. Uh, absolutely, of course, that, that's a must too. <laughs> yeah, and regarding Austria, you have to see Vienna. Absolutely beautiful, of course. But a lot of fantastic spots. Actually, Frankfurt is probably the most American-looking city in all of Europe, almost <laughs> because of the that skyline. You know, the, with the skyscrapers. I I totally yeah. agree. I know when we left there, my wife and I were kind of like. This isn't as exotic as I thought it was. And then we talked to other people. We had a German foreign exchange student live with us for a year. And she said, you you should have been to different towns. You should have planned this better. And I said, well, well, we guess next time we'll plan it better. But we'll do that. <laughs> I love Frankfurt. It's a fantastic city and then a great area. But, yeah, it has a, it has a certain look, which actually um, kind of looks a little bit American. Yeah. At least that, that part, you know, with the skyscrapers the financial district of Frankfurt. Well, thank you so much for your time. I want to say to our listeners one more time, uh, if you haven't heard Into the Open, I put it on my mid-year list on WeLoveMetal.com as the number one album of the year. I haven't found anything that has knocked that off, and I believe that'll probably be uh, my favorite album, my number one album of the year. So 21 Octane for people out there. Uh, we're going to be featuring them as much as possible on our website. Uh, so this Thanks is so just... Much, Oh, thank, thank you. This is I've been looking forward to this for a long, long time. I don't know if you saw, I posted, I tried to post, I had a 21 octane into the open birthday cake, as weird as that may sound. And uh, I've, I've seen a picture, man. I said, I really couldn't believe it, you know. <laughs> Actually, within our band, we were sending out that picture, like, you know, you know, in our band group. And, like, you know, on WhatsApp, you know, we're sending it fantastic, awesome. Man. Who did it? Who did that? Oh, that's good to hear. I little bit crazy, but I think you guys are just, uh, it's so refreshing. You're bringing something that so many people I know are going to enjoy. We just have to get them, you know, to get a sample of it, and then I, I, they'll fall in love. There's no doubt about it. So we'll talk again in the future. Alex, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. You're welcome. You're welcome. Man. Sure. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And yeah, anytime, man. Very good. Anytime you want to go. All right. Thank you very much.